Thank you very much, Paul. I'm really deeply honored. It's not a platitude to say that I am honored to help celebrate this uh, birthday party for the Technion and to participate in this interesting symposium on landmarks and science. I uh, liked the introduction. It went on a little too long, but uh, <laughs> so do I. <laughs> In fact, I learned recently that I'm not a senior citizen, but I'm, technolog I'm chronologically gifted. <laughs> so with that, uh, I will uh, begin, in fact, with uh, some newspaper and magazine articles. Gotcha is a Hebrew word, <laughs> which means uh, aha, or trapped, or something. And that came from Time Magazine and they were discussing, after 17 years of searching, physicists believe they have found a missing building block of matter. And that's what uh, was mentioned in the introduction. Here's a, a collage of, uh, of newspaper articles, the top quark in view. Physicists finally found evidence for the top quark. Physicists find final quark at Fermilab. That means we promise never again will we find <laughs> another quirk. In fact, most of us believe that that promise will be kept. So you see a lot of uh, comments, but some newspaper articles were not so sure. Scientists' top quirk find leaves us uh, speechless because, of course, in spite of the headlines, which I must say uh, were interesting that the news did report this on front pages and newspapers all over the world, uh, there was always in the articles a little bit of, you know, what is this? I mean, we have to report it because scientists say it's important, <laughs> but uh, why? So that's, uh, uh, now I was interested in, in 1980, 1897, there were 50,000 uh, people living in Israel. And so by the enormous possibilities of modern technology, we can recreate uh, the headlines of just about a hundred years ago. Uh, this is April 30th, 1897, the London Times or some magazine, newspaper like that. And it says, Cavendish scientists discover a charged corpuscle. Professor J.J. Thompson announces the discovery of a new object, not a ray, not a wave, but a small particle carrying an electric charge. The name electron has been assigned. It's a belief that the electron has something to do with the atom, but nobody knew exactly. But what was interesting was that the professors, the colleagues of J.J. Thompson, had a toast. They said, to the electron, may it forever remain useless. <laughs> so what is interesting is in this, this span of 100 years almost, uh, the first particle was discovered, the first truly fundamental particle, and Many of us believe the last one was discovered of the truly fundamental particle. So in order to set this into its proper historical uh, setup, I thought I would go back a little bit in time. Uh, science, uh, we believe, historians assure us, began in, in Miletus, not too far from here, uh, on the west coast of what is modern Turkey, 650 BC. I think it was Thursday. It must have been Thursday. <laughs> and uh, the breakthrough was that the world, uh, two, two new ideas, totally new ideas for the time. Uh, the world can be understood by logical reasoning. In other words, mythology, which adjusted humans to a frightening world of uh, all kinds of things, thunder and lightning and earthquakes and volcanoes and so on and the mythology was built up in a beautiful, uh, literate and uh, poetic way to account for the world and the, the businessmen of uh, this prosperous city of Miletus decided to try a different approach which would put aside mythology and try to use uh, logic, logos instead of mythos. And in the same time, a belief, a fundamental belief that the world, in spite of its appearing to be very complicated, was basically simple. And that, uh, that, uh, those two uh, items uh, seem to be the guiding uh, light of, of science. Uh, 
Uh, of course, the fax machines were slower in those days, so it took a few hundred years before the news came to Abdera, which is on the, the northern tip of the Aegean Sea in what is now uh, Thrace, part of Greece, where a gentleman with the interesting name of Democritos postulated the existence of things which were too small to see, already an imaginative idea, that you could think of something that you cannot see with your eyes. Uh, these things were in continuous motion. They were so small and uh, so hard that even uh, with the most sharpest knife you could imagine, you could not cut them. And tomos is the Greek word for cut, and atomos denies the possibility of cutting. And so he postulated the existence of things which the chemists, in their uh, lack of, of classical education, called atoms. Now, uh, the road from Miletus to uh, where we are now in, in Haifa uh, is fairly clear. It's, it's sometimes called the, uh, the reductionist road or the road to the atom. Uh, it uh, is not the only road in science, but it's the road we're following today, and it goes through various uh, important uh, uh, people like Democritus and Isaac Newton and Galileo and Faraday and so on. Uh, getting to more modern times, I highlighted Glashow because he's here. Uh, if you don't see your name on this list, you just have to work a little harder. Uh, we thought we would, uh, we would end up in a funny place in Texas, but that road turned out to be closed, and so uh, we're going on. There's a reference here to a, an American philosopher of baseball, Yogi Berra, who said, if we ever come to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> Adams had been known by chemists uh, since, uh, since the early 19th century, and later in that century, Faraday showed that atoms had electrical charges in them, but nobody knew the form of these charges. And then came this heroic event uh, of 100 years ago where J.J. Thompson, studying electrical discharges in gases, uh, established the existence of particles uh, called, which were already named electrons even before he discovered them uh, because of the work of Faraday mostly. Uh, there was suspected there were such things, uh, particles that would carry electric charge. Uh, in uh, 1911, Ernest Rutherford, working in England, solved the problem of how the charges in the, nuclei, in the atom are arranged so that all of the positive charge is in a tiny, small uh, volume, one trillionth of the size of the whole atom, and in that size is all of the mass. Uh, this little cartoon is illustrated that Rutherford was so shocked by the experiments in which alpha particles uh, were bounced backwards from the electron. He said, it's as if you took a, a cannon and you, sh you fired a, uh, a shell at, a, at a, a screen of tissue paper and the shell would bounce backwards and chase you all over the place. That was the discovery of the nucleus. Well, the atom created by Thomson's electrons and Rutherford's nucleus didn't work. It was alien to the known physics of the times, the physics established by Newton and Maxwell. Uh, alien is a good thing. I might here illustrate alien by uh, telling you the story of the Martian scientist who came to Earth uh, to greet the people of Earth, and he was interviewed, this Martian, by a reporter who said, do all Martians have three eyes? The Martian said, yes. And they all have three hands, one hand in the middle, he says, yes. And they all have these four feet, two with wheels and two with uh, fingers, he says, yes. And they all have this black circle on their head, no, he says, only the orthodox. <laughs> I forgot where I was. <laughs> In the period 1915-1930, a revolution in physics took place. Uh, and as with most revolutions, it did consume its own leaders. Framed by the Heisenberg uncertainty relations, inherent probabilistic nature of the, th of the theory, quantum theory, as it was called, produced the greatest change in mankind's view of the world in which he lives. Uh, the implications of the quantum theory is that in the atomic world, the 
the world of the atom, which was predicted by Democritus, things don't have the solid properties of a table and a chair or a book. Uh, things have only, in the micro world, a set of possible properties, each weighted by a certain probability until one actually made a measurement. Eventually, it was accepted as the most successful theory uh, ever proposed, uh, where one can predict the properties of particles like Thomson's electron uh, using something like 10 numbers and having the 10th number be still significant experimentally. Of course, it wasn't accepted by all scientists, including, uh, including Einstein, uh, who in fact uh, did not like the theory. So there was in fact in the early days uh, kind of a vote where the people against it were people like Einstein and Schrodinger and Planck and probably Lenin and Marx. <laughs> Uh, and uh, physics divided up into those that were for it and those that were against it. Uh, but uh, in spite of the fact that it had, and still has, uh, remarkably uh, counterintuitive and uh, spooky, mysterious, uh, spooky was Einstein's word, uh, implications, I know that uh, Richard Feynman, one of the great theoretical physicists, of our times uh, said, nobody understands quantum mechanics. And my students would say, well, what do you want from us? <laughs> but it worked. It gave us an understanding and control of atoms. And if you understand an atom, you know on how two atoms combine to make a molecule, the structure of solids and liquids and gases and metals and insulators and semiconductors. Its technological consequences were vast. Today, the devices that come out of an understanding of quantum theory account for, if you want to be practical, a major fraction of the GNP of industrial nations. In fact, if the things that we invented because we understood the quantum theory would stop working, the GNP would go to zero. But that's not fair. You could always replace things uh, with old-fashioned devices. So, uh, but it's still an enormous contribution to the way people live and behave. And uh, its, its applications are still, uh, are still beyond anything most people can imagine. And also, it provided an essential tool for further progress in all sciences, in the nucleus, in the subnuclear domain, in cosmology, in chemistry, molecular biology, and so on. Uh, which is a, one of the most incredible examples of the abstract basic research uh, having uh, incredible payoffs. Now let's go to nucleus. In this small, tiny, one trillionth of the atom nucleus were crowded protons. And in 1932, Chadwick, a member of the Rutherford group, discovered the neutron, also in the nucleus, an uncharged twin of the proton. So about the 1930s, we had electron, proton, and neutron. And then an idea of Wolfgang Pauli became more credible that somewhere uh, there exists a particle which is extremely difficult to detect, but it must exist. And he, uh, called, he also called it a neutron, but eventually it became called a neutrino. So that uh, in the 30s, uh, the assumption was that the fundamental basic particles consisted of electrons, protons, neutrons, and neutrinos. The neutrons and protons cluster in a tiny nucleus. Electrons float around in some sort of a cloud to make the atom. And the neutrino is thought to be born uh, in the rare explosions of what are usually fairly stable nuclei. The study of the nucleus began in, uh, after World War II in a serious way, based on new technologies and a new relationship between uh, science and government uh, with uh, un unimaginably huge sums of money suddenly becoming available. Uh, the technique for studying the nucleus was to accelerate particles to some enormous energies. We use millions of volts as a measure of energy and uh, make collisions between the particles you're accelerating and the innocent, quiet nucleus, uh, breaking them apart and studying the debris of the collisions. And that, it, that, that program worked. We did learn about the forces between particles. But something else, a surprise, as often happens in science, New particles were created out of the energy carried in by the incident particle using uh, Einstein's uh, e famous equation, E equals mc squared, where energy is converted to matter. Well, this was very exciting. The new particles didn't live very long, but long enough 
for clever experimenters to get some of their properties, like their mass, how heavy they are, the electric charge, the spin, the lifetime, and other quantum properties, and then to find out what their names were. And by international agreement, uh, we use the Greek alphabet. In fact, there was a meeting not long ago uh, which was uh, designed, uh, it was an emergency meeting to decide which alphabet would be used after we used up all the Greek letters. I think Hebrew was considered one of the leading candidates. In fact, there's a, there's a uh, device in CERN called the Aleph detector. Uh, collectively, all these particles were given uh, the Greek designation hadrons. Uh, because it seems suggestive of these particles born in these ferocious collisions. And here is a very short list of some of these hadrons, which you should memorize, uh, uh, about the time of 1970. This was very discouraging. Physicists were getting very uh, upset because the Greeks promised us something simple. And here with these new devices, these new knives to cut open matter, we found an incredible unexpected complexity. Uh, some physicists jumped out of first floor windows in discouragement. And then uh, good things happened. In the 1960s, the idea came up that perhaps all of these particles themselves are complicated. They're not the fundamental particles, like the electron, which was considered to be a pure basic particle. But they were, in fact, complicated, and they had things inside them. And those things were called quarks by Murray Gell-Mann. Uh, one of the inventors of this idea. And at that time, in 1964, three quarks, which are today called up, down, and strange. Why are they called up, down, and strange? I don't know. Uh, the names are usually whimsical. But these three quarks, put together in different ways, would account for that entire table I showed you a little bit before. You take a handful of particles, like the proton, the neutron, and the lambda, and you would adjust the properties of the quarks uh, so that you would replicate, in many ways, the properties of these hadrons. And then you had 100 particles you could compare the two, and the model seemed to work. The quarks made the hadrons. Uh, they had curious properties. And, even more so, somewhere implicit in the hypothesis of quarks was the Democritus idea that the quarks are, in fact, indivisible, atomos, unable to be cut primordial. In fact, the easiest way to think about something which you can't cut is to make the assumption, a uh, plausible assumption, that the, these quarks have lots of properties, charge, spin, all the things, mass, but they don't have a radius. They take up no space. They are point-like. And therefore, we'll never get, in, if we don't believe that, uh, we'll never get into trouble with who's inside the quark. That is an experimental question, which is still open. But we're very comfortable now with point-like quarks. And it reminded us that there were other particles, unlike the quarks. The electron is an example. We already mentioned the neutrino. And there was a funny particle called a muon that had been discovered in the 1930s, which seemed to be of a different class than the quarks. The quarks combine together strongly to form the neutrons and protons and lambdas and other things. These do not combine together. And so collectively, they were called leptons. They were also very low in mass. And so, in the 1960s, the belief began, which is still with us today, that all of the matter in the universe is made of two types of particles, quarks and leptons. And so we were back to some road which looked toward like we were heading for simplicity. Three quarks, that's not so bad. Three is a good number. Theorists like the number three. It turns out theorists like any number. It doesn't matter, as long as they know it's the truth. In 1961, uh, Another lepton was discovered, so that the lepton family then, after that lepton was discovered, found a, an attractive pattern, a symmetry, if you like, where the electron has a cousin called a neutrino, and the muon has a cousin, also a neutrino, but now these things grew subscripts. Neutrino electron, neutrino muon. And this suggested the possibility, uh, in fact, by, uh, by Glashow and a friend of his, uh, that uh, since there were only three quarks and four leptons, that uh, wouldn't it be charming if there was another quark? And in fact, in 1975, the quark was discovered, and of course, it was called charm. Uh, in fact, Glashow found uh, an even better reason than just symmetry later on, so that the charm quark was really uh, expected when it was found. 
But things that were not expected were the things that happened later in that decade. A fifth lepton was discovered called tau, and a fifth quark called beauty or bottom. Uh, and the reason, well, let's forget about beauty for the moment. Now, let's not never forget about beauty, but let's put it aside for the moment and think about this quark is called a bottom. And it was called a bottom for the same reason that we already began to believe that these things were connected in some way so that they would come in twos. And uh, we had the strange quark, you'll read, we had the up, down, up quark and down quark. We had the charm quark and strange quark. So we assumed that would be a top quark that would be found shortly after the bottom quark. We named it bottom and waited for the top. Unfortunately, the wait was long. It took 17 years uh, before the top quark was discovered uh, a few weeks ago at Fermilab. Well, I mentioned the particles, the basic particles. I should say a few words about the forces. Uh, I spend hours drawing these pictures. <laughs> Uh, we mentioned that Newton established the law of gravity that was modified in 1915 by Einstein's general theory of relativity, a theory about gravity. We mentioned that Faraday and Maxwell and were the experimenters, uh, Coulomb and, uh, and so on. It's amazing how these people's names uh, are related to electrical measurements. It's established the electromagnetic force. And then in the 1900s, two new forces were identified. Uh, the uh, strong force, uh, which we already mentioned, the force uh, that holds neutrons and protons together, and later became the force that holds quarks together. And then, in the, again, very close to the end of the 19th century, radioactivity was discovered, uh, and that was evidence for a new kind of force called the weak force. So we had the relativity, we had gravity, electromagnetic force, the strong force, and the weak force. Now, this chart I want to skip almost. Uh, the, the laboratories uh, made a lot of uh, progress in studying the properties of these quarks, how strong they were, how weak they were, how they would behave with distance, many other qualities of these uh, forces. And the theoretical physicists worked at this, and eventually it became clear that there was only one class of theories uh, that was successful in describing these forces. And the only point I want to make is that these theories suggested that the forces themselves uh, are produced by particles uh, that carry the force, or the information of the force, so that something called the photons, which was suggested by Einstein in 1905 and experimentally proved by sometime in the 20s, uh, carried the electromagnetic force. The Ws and Zs carried the weak force. These were very heavy particles. The gluons carried the strong force. What else would you call something that carries a strong force? And by 1983, all these particles had been identified and their properties measured uh, so that the notion of this kind of symmetry which, in which particles of a different kind, remember the quarks and leptons are matter, and these are forces. Let me give you a, a little uh, idea of the hardware that goes into all this uh, just by showing some pictures. I happen to have the picture of the laboratory outside of Chicago, Fermi Lab, in a place called Batavia, Chicago, somewhere on the skyline. This is a ring which is uh, six kilometers in circumference. In the United States, we're inching towards the metric system. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's the largest particle accelerator in the world uh, right now. It's a rather beautiful accelerator, and you're all invited to come and visit uh, this accelerator. Incidentally, doing a little bit of archaeological research, I have discovered something which I will share with you. Uh, it's not published yet. Just look at this picture and compare these two pictures. And it seems to me that uh, it's very clear what this is all about. It's the first Druid particle accelerator. It was built uh, 2000 BC. It cost $8 billion. <laughs> Here is a, uh, a pipe. Uh, you can imagine this pipe being uh, about 10 centimeters in diameter. Uh, it has no air in it. It's a vacuum. And uh, in this pipe are protons, which are going around the six kilometer circumference. And uh, uh, say, 
uh, in one direction and by clever, uh, incredibly clever organization, protons of a negative charge, antiprotons, are going in the opposite direction. And then as they get closer and closer together, powerful magnets squeeze them so that they are very dense. And then they make head-on collisions uh, at a total energy of 1.8 trillion volts, uh, <clears throat> which is, uh, as I say, the very, very highest energy anywhere in the world. And then one, in order to understand what's going on in these collisions, you build some sort of a device that you put around this thing, which will identify the particles and count them, and try to understand with this enormous energy, what sort of new worlds can you produce? Uh, that's the general quick idea. The actual detector uh, that is used in this is a rather monstrous device. It weighs about 5,000 tons. Uh, it took uh, eight years for some hundreds of physicists and engineers in collaboration, in intimate collaboration, people in Italy and Japan from all over the world bringing their things together and fitting them all in. It has something like 100,000 sensors which uh, detect particles and send information over 100,000 wires to a, uh, essentially a home-built computer uh, to look at what's, what's going on. And the thing of interest uh, is the top quark. I thought I'd spend a minute uh, showing you sort of how one discovers a new quark. It's a very complex uh, thing. They've been working at this uh, for many years. And uh, what, what, what is happening is the proton and antiproton collide. They produce energy. The energy is converted to mass. And one collision out of every trillion or so collisions, you make a top quark and its twin, its mirror image, the anti-top quark. Each of these lives for an incredibly small fraction of a second. Therefore, they never move, even though they're moving with a velocity of light. They never move away from that collision point by any measurable distance. And then they themselves disintegrate into things called Ws, the weak force carrier, and the bottom quark, which is related to the top quark. These things are both unstable. And again, so there's a whole sequence of events. But the final events are stable. And what you get is from one an electron and from the other a muon and from the B quark a narrow spray of hadrons called jets. That's a slang. And you study these things in great quantitative detail, measuring all the properties. And eventually you come to the conclusion uh, that uh, this is uh, very strong evidence for the decay of a top quark. Although many other things can confuse you. And so the report was a little bit tentative. They saw something like a dozen events of this general nature, and, but they still were worried because there was a, a, a background, a sort of a noise level, which might confuse them. But anyway, uh, we can summarize everything we've learned on this page, which uh, goes by the name of the standard model. Since most of the theoretical physicists who, uh, who associated with this came out of New York, Shelley Glashow proposed that it be called the New York model. But I think that would be sort of provincial. Uh, but now we organize the particles into three generations. And now we have them, the up quark and the down quark, the charm and the strange, the top and the bottom. And the electron, the first particle, was discovered in 1897. And the top quark in 1994, three years ahead of schedule. And we have the leptons, uh, the neutrinos and the leptons. And together, these are the matter particles. And we believe, perhaps, the particles which designate and describe all the matter uh, we know about in the universe, the protons and neutrons and hadrons that make the, the Earth and the sun and the stars that we can study. The strong force is carried by gluons, the weak force by Ws, the electromagnetic force by photons. And gravity is something we don't know too much about. We assume that it's carried by some objects which, whose existence is suggested but not really proved. So, and also what's very interesting about this, this array is the electron, the first particle, has a mass in, of the, in measured in millions of volts of 0.5. And the top quark, which is a reason why it took so long to find it, is enormously massive, 175,000 million volts. Uh, this is the range. Now, some of the neutrinos are very likely to be, in fact, known to be much, much less than 0.5 MeV. Some of them might even be zero in mass. We don't know. But the range of masses is enormous. 
And mass turns out to be the frontier of our understanding uh, in the 1990s. Okay, summarize. In today's universe, the up quark and the down quark make up all the protons and neutrons and uh, make up the nuclei of all of the chemical elements from hydrogen all the way to uranium and beyond. The electrons, if you add them, you make atoms out of the nuclei. And then there are photons, particles of light, uh, and gluons, which keep the atoms together and keep the nuclei together. And in radioactive processes, largely in stars, but a little bit on Earth, there are neutrinos which are emitted through the action of Ws and Zs. The higher generations, the charm quark and strange quark, or, and so on. In fact, the muon, uh, someone mentioned I.I. Robbie. When the muon was discovered, Robbie said, who needs that? And that's a good question. However, in the earliest instances of the very, very young universe, the cosmologists tell us the temperature was enormous. And this uh, incredible source of energy uh, was such that all the matter, including the top quarks, uh, were as important uh, as, as any of the other quarks, so that in the origin of the universe, uh, all of the quarks and all of the, which today are uh, only seen with the great expense of, of building special machines, they were just the ordinary objects of the early universe. So we have to discuss what our colleagues, the cosmologists, have learned about the universe. Now, whenever I, whenever I uh, bring up the subject of cosmology, I always feel a little bit uncertain about it, and we'll tell here the story of, the, uh, uh, of uh, President Bush, who in fact was visiting uh, Helsinki, Finland, on a state visit, and at some point he asked uh, permission to, uh, he brought from all the way from Washington a wreath of beautiful flowers. He was going to put it on the tomb of the unknown soldier. Well, the Finnish uh, people looked at each other behind his back and said, what should we do? We don't have such a thing. So one of them said, follow me. So the procession of limousines went across Helsinki and came to the town square. And there was a statue of Sibelius. Now, <laughs> President of the United States is a college graduate. Came from one of those places called Yale, I think. And so he recognized Sibelius. He says, that's Sibelius, the famous composer. And I said, yeah, as a composer, he's famous. As a soldier, he's totally unknown. <laughs> As a, as a physicist, I'm famous. <laughs> as a cosmologist, uh, but uh, clearly, over the last uh, you know, century, uh, 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 while the physicists were making these enormous particle accelerators, the, cos the cosmologists and astronomers were building telescopes and radio telescopes and, and satellite-based uh, observatories of various kinds. And they learned a lot about the world in which we live. They learned that the universe was very dynamic, that it's filled with uh, stars that explode and, and double stars and quasars and pulsars and black holes and some mysterious substance which we have no idea about called dark matter, which could, if we ever find out about it, change the story I told you dramatically. We know the universe is expanding. Its temperature is falling. Today, its average temperature is a little less than three degrees above absolute zero. It's filled with this gamma rays, photons, black body radiation at that typical temperature. We know a lot about the amount of hydrogen and light elements, hydrogen and deuterium and helium and so on, lithium. Uh, we know how much there are in the stars, even quite distant stars. And we know something about this mysterious large scale structure. Now, if you take the composite of all the data, they too have a standard model of cosmology, which said that about 15 billion years ago, all the matter in the presently observed universe was compressed to a submicroscopic point, maybe a point at an incredibly high temperature and pressure. Temperature and pressure being so high that matter was decomposed into its most primordial components, presumably the quarks and leptons and that's what accounts for the connection between uh, the inner space, the reductionist road, and the huge uh, uh, universe around us that in the beginning, uh, the universe was smaller than an atom, smaller than a nucleus, and therefore both subjects were involved in this 
in this procedure. And a lot has been learned and may be illustrated by this graph, which, which plots time here, starting at the beginning. This is zero time, and this is 15 billion years now. And uh, this is temperature. So if you're going from the beginning, the universe is getting colder and colder and colder. Or if you go backwards in time, which you can do in your imagination, uh, the universe gets hotter and hotter. So that if we go backwards, we find that the solar system came fairly recently, about four billion years ago. The galaxies were formed somewhat earlier. And here, it was so hot, uh, if you go in this direction, that the temperature is such that atoms cannot exist. The heat is so much that the electrons are torn away from the nuclei. The virtue of this era is that you don't need chemists because there's no chemicals. But uh, pretty soon you don't need anybody. <laughs> uh, here's where the, where the quarks combine to form the protons and neutrons. And uh, the cooler you are, the more you can make complex structures. And now we're in a region which is essentially uh, speculated and not understood, but it gives you the role of accelerators, and accelerator is a kind of time machine which replicates the properties of matter uh, at some early, early time. Somewhere after now will be world peace, and then the Chicago Cubs will <laughs> win the World Series. Now, it's fascinating that uh, if we plot again in a similar scale, the time here and the scale size, the universe is is uh, growing in size up to now, and we have various predictions as to what might happen in the future. The universe might slow down its expansion and re-collapse in something called a big squeeze or a big crunch, or the universe might continue expanding at an ever-increasing pace, or it might continue to expand with an ever slower pace called the asymptotic universe. And the criticisms of the early universe uh, you can, there are still many, many open questions, and I'll end my talk on a few open questions. Uh, which one of these is the correct path? I will tell you there's a consensus, it doesn't mean it's right, that, if, that the asymptotic universe is the correct path. Uh, all kinds of questions. I already mentioned dark matter. Uh, then you can always say what happened before the Big Bang. Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, and so on. There are lots of open questions in cosmology, and then we might also criticize this standard model, the New York model uh, of particles and forces. It's an incredibly concise, uh, you can fit this on a t-shirt uh, if it's a large size, uh, and it accounts for all of the data from all of the laboratories since, uh, since the beginnings of what we call modern physics in PISA maybe, uh, but there are too many particles because I didn't tell you about the antiparticles. Uh, there are six quarks and six leptons, and then there's an equal number in the antimatter world, and some of the quarks, the quarks themselves, uh, come in different colors. It's pretty complicated. And then also, if you now, even though it accounts for the data we have, if you try to predict what happens at higher energies, energies of an accelerator that might cost, for example, $8 billion, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the predictions are not successful. They're, they predict nonsense. The, 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 the theory is mathematically inconsistent. And of course, it does not include gravity. So the question is, is there a simpler, more unified structure which will describe the physical universe? And my penultimate chart says that, summarizes the question. Cosmologists have to know the fundamental particles and forces to model the origin and evolution of the universe. The particle physicist must know data from this, this uh, great accelerator in the sky. The, the early universe, the Big Bang, was a laboratory with a totally unconstrained budget. Both must still understand these symmetries, the unifications of forces and particles which most of us believe will eventually show up, and this failure of the standard model of high energies. Now, I'll just... Uh, end with this uh, new idea, which is uh, going to end with a question mark, came in, out in the 70s, which was a kind of breakthrough in this 2,500-year-old quest uh, of uh, trying to understand the inner simplicity uh, in a world that looks so complicated. And this, this thing shared by the ancient Greek philosophers and the modern mathematical physicists has a name, uh, this new idea. It's called the Higgs something. I don't know, Higgs ghost or thing, 
It's a kind of field that is postulated to fill all of space. It is supposed to hide the simplicity and, uh, and uh, hide the symmetry. And uh, it does this by giving uh, a enormously complicated and not understood variety of masses to particles. I mean, it would be nice if all the particles had zero mass, then they would collapse to, to a very small number. But the uh, Higgs field doesn't allow that to happen. It gives particles masses. And independently, the cosmologists have discovered the need for a phenomenon like Higgs. Confronting the Higgs idea was the primary motivation for this uh, uh, megalomania idea of building an accelerator. It was designed to confront the Higgs uh, thing. And uh, so we leave this uh, uh, landmark uh, of science uh, talk with a question. Uh, what is the Higgs thing? And someday uh, it'll be uh, discussed, whether it's 10 years from now, or 20 years from now, or 50 years from now. And then we have a happy birthday to Technion. Thank you. <laughs>